Matthew 25, verses 14 through 30 is what we're going to read today, the parable of the talents. Matthew 25, starting at verse 14. Again, it will be like a man going on a journey who called his servants and entrusted his property to them. To one he gave five talents of money, to another two talents, and to another one talent, each according to his ability. Then he went on his journey. The man who had received the five talents went at once and put his money to work and gained five more. So also the one with the two talents gained two more. But the man who had received the one talent went off, dug a hole in the ground, and hid his master's money. After a long time, the master of those servants returned and settled accounts with them. The man who had received the five talents brought the other five. Master, he said, you had trusted me with five talents. See, I have gained five more. His master replied, well done, good and faithful servant. You've been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share your master's happiness. The man with the two talents also came. Master, he said, you had trusted me with two talents. See, I have gained two more. His master replied, Well done, good and faithful servant. You've been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share your master's happiness. Then the man who had received the one talent came. Master, he said, I knew that you were a hard man, harvesting where you have not sown and gathered, gathering where you have not scattered seed. So I was afraid and went out and hid your talent in the ground. See, here is what belongs to you. His master replied, You wicked, lazy servant. So you knew that I harvest where I have not sown and gathered where I have not scattered seed? Well, then you should have put my money on deposit with the bankers so that when I returned I would receive it back with interest. Take the talent from him and give it to the one who has the ten talents. For everyone who has will be given more, and he will have an abundance. Whoever does not have, even what he has will be taken from him. And throw that worthless servant outside into the darkness, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. That's the parable that Jesus told. So, what was so bad about this third servant with the one talent? Why, why was he so bad in hiding the money in the ground? I mean, some people save their money that way. They hide it away in a mattress, or there's people who bury gold or something. You know, why, why was it so bad that he hid the master's money like that? Doesn't seem like that was all that bad, does it? Well, when you look at when he comes back to the master, he says, Master, I know that you are a hard man. You harvest where you have not sown, and you gather where you have not scattered seed. So I was afraid. And then the master's response, Oh, you you knew then that I harvest where I do not sow, and I gather where I do not scattered seed. So he played it safe with his master's money when he knew his master was a shrewd businessman. If you're an employee somewhere and you're told to do something and it's not unreasonable or anything like that, it's it's part of your job, you do that job, right? I mean, that's what you're there for, to, to do the work that you're given to do. Well, in this case, this servant knew what his master wanted And he didn't do it. He knew what he was supposed to do, but he was unwilling to do it. He was afraid. He had his job description, but he didn't follow it. Now, in the broader context, we're looking at different kinds of what you might call fake faith. There's... There's a kind of way that we can feel like we're Christians, but really on the inside we're, we're kind of holding back. And we talked about a couple of weeks ago now how some of us like to go it alone. 
we, we, we can be a Christian all by ourselves. We don't need other Christians to, to help us in any way. We can just be by ourselves. We can do our praying and reading our Bible on our own. We don't need to be attached to a church in any way. We just, we just go it alone. Well, we can't do that. We have to belong to the body of Christ. We have to belong to the body of believers. But then you could go the other way, too. The other extreme, where it's just about belonging to this body of believers, and it becomes kind of a social club. And as long as you just do the church thing, then you're all set. But that's not what it's about either. The church is not a social club. We do social things, but we're not a club. The body of believers, we're on a mission to bring Jesus to each other and to the world. And so we're not here just to hang out and to have fun. We're here to bring Jesus to each other. Like to show his love to each other, to encourage each other, sometimes admonish one another, and things like that. And we're here to work together to bring Jesus everywhere else too. To be a blessing to our neighbors. But then there's a third kind of fake faith, if you will. And this one might be a temptation for, for some of us too. And this third kind of fake faith is being a fan, but not a follower. We'll, we'll, be, a, we'll be a Jesus fan, but when it comes to actually committing, when it comes to actually sacrificing, taking risks, eh, we kind of we shy away from those things. We don't want to have to actually do any work, make any sacrifices. But the truth is, is that God is not like being a fan of the Lions or the Spartans or the Wolverines. That's not what being a Christian is about. It's not like being a fan of some musical group like One Direction or anything like that. It's not like you just have to hit like Jesus on Facebook and then you're a Christian. If you go on Facebook, it's in you, there's a section for religious views. And there's tons of people who put Christian right there. But like we just sang about, do they know that we're Christians? Do we show that kind of love? Do we work with each other? Do we give all praise to the Father and the Son and the Spirit? God expects more than just watching games every week and keeping track of statistics. God expects more than just buying albums and going to concerts. Plenty of people like God as a fan, but they won't take any risks. There's no relationship if you're following the Lions or you're a fan of One Direction. There's not a relationship there. You're just... You're just following them. With God, there's, there's give and take. You interact with Him. Now, it's easy to fill a seat at church on Sunday. That's easy. We can do that. It's easy to put a Jesus fish on your car. It's easy to listen to Christian radio. We can do those things. And we can appear to be Christian by doing those things. We can feel like we're Christians and other people can look at us and think, oh, they're a Christian because they do this, this, and this. But we can be a fan and not be a follower. We can just have that look of a Christian, but we really don't want to sacrifice anything. We don't want to do anything difficult. If it if it means that we've got to give up stuff that we like, then, then we're just going to not pay attention to God on those things. It's easy to be saved by grace and call it good. Because we are saved by grace. We're not saved by what we do. We can't earn God's love. And we can't be good and keep God's love. God loves us like a father. 
we're his children no matter what. So we don't earn his love, we don't earn our salvation, but do we show love back to God? So look at the screen here with me if you would. How can you say that the good we do doesn't earn anything when God promises to reward it in this life and the next? This reward is not earned. It is a gift of grace. But doesn't this teaching, the teaching that uh, we, don't, we don't have to do anything, we're saved by grace and not by works, doesn't this teaching make people indifferent and wicked? No. It is impossible for those grafted into Christ by true faith not to produce fruits of gratitude. In other words, if Christ is really in you and you truly belong to him, then it's going to show without you even thinking about it. And it's not about, okay, do the church thing, put the Jesus fish on there, listen to Christian radio. It's not about those things. It becomes something that comes from the inside out. If you belong to Christ and he is in your heart, then it works its way out. We're not saved by our actions. I want to go over this because this, this is often confused. Because there's a lot of parts of the Bible that talk about, you know, hey, shape up. You know, get in line. Do, do what God asks you to do. Don't just give them lip service, you know. So there's a lot of parts where if you read the Bible, you could think, wow, God just wants us to be good people or just to do these things and then we're good. And there's other parts of the Bible that say, well, we're saved by grace. So here's how it works. Salvation is first, and I'll give you a big word to learn here, justification. Salvation is number one, justification. In other words, God adopts us as his children and he applies Christ's righteousness to us. So the perfect life that Christ lived, God says, okay, that, that applies to, to you now. And there's a, a gavel that bangs in heaven and it says, not guilty of all the sins that we've committed. That's justification. That means our sins are gone. We belong to God now. And there's no ifs, ands, or buts about it. Okay? But then salvation is also, number two, another big word, sanctification. And that means God is raising us to grow in trust, in love, in surrender, and many other things too. So we don't just, we're not just Say we're having our sins cleared away. Okay, we got our ticket to heaven. We're all set. No, it's, that's not what salvation is. It's not just, okay, let's wait out this life so we can get to the next one. It's, no, let's get free of sin now because we still have sin that drags us down. We still have parts of our lives that we're still too connected to the world. We still have parts that don't really like what God says. And we need to learn ever so slowly to be more like Jesus. So God takes our sins away, but then he adopts us as his children, and he doesn't just let us do whatever he wants. I mean, lots of you out there are parents, and you know what it's like to have a kid or raise a kid. And do you just let the kid decide to do whatever they want to do whenever they want to do it? No, there's things that the kids have to do. They have to go to school, right? They need to do their homework. You give them chores to do. You give them responsibilities. You teach them how to walk. You teach them how to tie their own shoes. You teach them how to manage the money that they have when they start to earn it. You, you build them up so that they start to become more and more like adults. Well, and God is our Father, he doesn't want us to just be his kids. He wants us to, okay, I'm, I, I love you. I want you to grow up to be like me. This is, this is the way it works. I don't want you to be stuck in toddler mode forever. So 
So God wants to free us from our fears, our addictions, our worship of other things that enslave us. And we think that the things that we're attached to here and now, our own, our own impulses and stuff, we, we think that those things are, uh, we think that we're in control of them, but we're really not. I mean, one of, the, one of the things that addicts will say is, I'm not an addict. There's, there's lots of denial there. Well, it's easy for us to say, well, yeah, I, I've got this, but I could, I could quit any time, you know. It's, I, I, I worship God more than this, but really deep inside, we couldn't really let go of this, whatever that may be. But God wants us to, with faith and prayer, take risks to serve him. Take risks. There are certain things that we think that we can't live without. And really, we could. For example, last week, if you were here, we had Scott Goering here. And he's working to serve Spanish-speaking people in this area, particularly with Iglesia Alas de Aguila, that's just down the street here in Allendale. Um, he, he came back to the United States after being a missionary in Mexico for, I want to say, 20-some years. And he came back before retirement <laughs> to do that because he felt like God was leading him back here. And once he got back here, he got a bunch of job offers. You know, he's a few years away from retiring, and he got a bunch of job offers. And they were all steady jobs with good income. He turned them all down. Because he didn't feel like, it didn't seem like that's where God wanted him to, to go. And instead, of any of that, any of that steady, reliable stuff, he realizes that God wants him to work with this Hispanic church. And so he looks and sees about doing that, and there's all kinds of doors opening up for him. He doesn't know where the money's going to come from or where he's going to get the money to, to feed himself and everything like that, but God has been providing for him. And things have just started to happen. He's taking big risks to do this. Not all of us will have to take those same risks, but God does want us to take some risks at the right time and place, depending on what our gifts may be. In, in this parable here, it kind of like business, I'm not a businessman, but I've heard this more than a few times, and I think it's, it sounds accurate. You have to spend money to make money. In business, if you want to succeed, you have to spend money to make money. You have to advertise. You have to improve the material that you have. Build an inventory that's, that's better. Um, you have to invest in maybe workers that are really effective and, and do a good job. You have to spend money to make money. This last servant, he was not willing to spend money to make money. He was afraid. He didn't want to take any risks. Well, in, this, in a similar way, you have to risk faith to grow it. You have to take risks in faith so that your faith will grow. So, for example... Risk, sometimes risk mockery and rejection by sharing your faith. There's people out there who might need to know about Jesus and, and maybe there's, you're in a conversation and it's starting to come around that way and you could mention, you know, I, I believe that Jesus is everything that I need. And maybe they'll laugh at you. Maybe... They'll make fun of you forever for it. But who cares? 
Take that risk. Or maybe you're at a job and um, your boss tells you to do something that's wrong. <coughs> something that is not just questionable, but it's, it's flat out wrong. And in your mind you're saying, um, this is not what God would want me to do. I'm not going to do that. And so you tell your boss, um, yeah, I, I, Jesus is my number one boss and I don't think I can do that. Take that risk. It's better to, it's better to say, you know what, I'm going to do what Jesus wants me to do rather than to do something that I know he doesn't want me to do. And I'll risk whatever it takes to do that. God expects us to be all in with him. If we're with God, if we belong to him, he wants us to be all in. Not one foot in, one foot out. Not on the fence at all. He wants us all in. And all of us are in some sort of relationships of some kind, right? We have family, we have friends, we have loved ones. In marriage, for example, you make vows till death do us part. For better, for worse, for richer, for poorer. There's a lot of risk in saying those things and taking those vows. But when it comes to a relationship, you take those risks. When it comes to children, children take tons of time and energy to raise. And they can cause you all kinds of worry and sometimes heartache. You have to be all in to be a good parent. If you have family members and they're running into difficult times, you do whatever you could for them. Because they're your family. And the same thing for your friends. If there's a friend that's, that you're close with and, and they're going through a rough time, you, you'll be there for them. You'll make the time. God is a relationship too. He's our Father. And we need to be all in with Him. Anybody can call themselves a Christian, but if Jesus is Lord... Not just our Savior, but if He's our Lord, then you will obey Him even when it's risky. You'll do what He says, even if it costs you something big. Whether that's money, pride, reputation, your own interests, your own ambition, whatever that may be. You'll take risks to do it. And He's worth the risk. Jesus came here to die for each one of us so that we could be with him. Because when you're in a relationship, you are committed to that relationship. And Jesus demonstrated that ultimate commitment by dying for us. So just a line to leave you with. This, this man in the parable of the talents, he was unwilling to take a risk. Even though it's what his master wanted him to do. He, he was a fan, but he wasn't really a follower because he wasn't really committed. But real faith takes risks. Real faith takes risks. Be willing to sacrifice for the Lord to do what He wants. Be willing to suffer for being a Christian, doing what God wants you to do. Real faith takes risks. We can't just be a fan. We need to be a follower. All in. We need some help with that. Let's pray about it. Lord God, we're, we're just human beings. We're, we're weak and Lord, we, we make mistakes. Lord, our eye isn't always on the ball and Lord, we, we fail you. But Lord, we pray that instead we would always look to be 
fully committed to you. We pray that we would be willing to take risks, whatever they may be. We pray that we would be willing to suffer if it means suffering for you. And that we would be obedient to you even if it costs us dearly. Not for our sakes, but for the sake of you and your name, your glory. And so that we can show you that we love you in return. In the name of Jesus we pray. Amen.